Check out this shot from Kill Bill. Is there anything familiar about the way that it's shot or edited? Well, you might have spotted that there's lots of nods to classic martial arts films, evident in the crash zooms, the sound effects, and the extreme close-ups of the eyes. How about this picture of David Cameron from The Sun? What's it trying to resemble? Well, it's clearly been painted in the same style as Shepard Fairley's Hope poster for Barack Obama's campaign in an effort to represent him as similarly an exciting and inspiring leader as Obama was. Both of these are examples of intertextuality, and in this video, I'm going to clearly explain what the concept is. So in a nutshell, intertextuality is when one text makes reference to another, either directly or indirectly. Now it's important that we clarify that last point because there are effectively two types of intertextuality. The first type is indirect intertextuality, and this acknowledges that every producer is unavoidably going to be inspired by everything they've ever seen before. So there are going to be traces of other texts within their own, even if they aren't explicit. Consider these texts. Is it possible that this Hearthstone trailer would look just like this without decades of Pixar films? There's no sign of Buzz Lightyear or Nemo here, but the design and format of the trailer is unmistakably Pixar, so we'd call this an example of indirect intertextuality. The Star Wars opening crawl is a great example of indirect intertextuality. It appears to have been inspired by Flash Gordon's opening crawl. Now it's not directly referencing Flash Gordon, but the influences are clearly visible indirect intertextuality. It works with narrative too. There's an obvious link between uh, life and alien. Unsuspecting humans find exciting new life before getting killed by it. Sounds familiar. Indirect intertextuality. Now the second type of intertextuality is direct or deliberate intertextuality. Here's an example. Come and dream with me. In this Scorsese film, there are countless specific references to A Trip to the Moon by Georges Emilier. In fact, it's integral to the plot. You can still follow and understand the film without any prior knowledge of the other film, but for those who make the intertextual reference, there is a greater meaning to the boy's lineage. He's part of cinema's ancestry. Here's another example of direct intertextuality, this time from The Simpsons. Direct, explicit references being made to another text, in this case for parody, to be funny. So what's the point in intertextuality? How do producers use it? Well, when the link is indirect, it's more of an acknowledgement of what might inspire the producer. And in some cases, it might help quickly establish themes for the audience if uh, we're seeing something that we've already seen before. In the music video for Who Run the World by Beyonce, we're able to quickly establish that this is a post-apocalyptic landscape because of the indirect intertextual references to films like Mad Max. But when a text makes a direct link to another text, they're doing it on purpose, they're doing it for a reason. They want the audience to make the link and realize something. Now it can be done very casually like this. He doesn't like you. I'm sorry. I don't like you either. You just watch yourself. Oh. Hey, you just watch yourself. No, no. Sorry, sorry. We don't want any trouble, sorry. Well, there's very little to gain other than a cool Easter egg. Or as we've already seen, it can be done for the sake of satire or parody, like this. Okay, boy, sit. Reach for the sky. Gotcha! <laughs> pew, 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 pew! Reach for the sky! <gasps> oh no, Sheriff Deadpool. You know, you're a lot taller. I'm glad you could join me today. Let's just drive right in and run all the colors across the screen that you'll need to paint along with me. But on other special occasions, it can be used very subtly to weave meanings from other texts into new texts. Here's an example from Star Trek VI where Hamlet is used very nicely. I offer a toast. The undiscovered country. The future. The undiscovered country. Hamlet, Act Three, Scene One. You have not experienced Shakespeare until you have read him in the original Klingon. Tach, pa, tach, be. 
<laughs> in this Star Trek film, the conflicting themes of war or peace with the Klingons is mirrored in Hamlet's soliloquy, in which he's basically asking whether it's better to live and struggle, or to die and take the easy route. Tach pa! Tach be! The reference to Shakespeare makes the diplomacy of the film so much more important. It's a decision that could mean life or death. If you've seen the trailers for the new Ready Player One film, then you've already been subjected to loads and loads of direct intertextuality. It's in many of the characters, the props, I think done very nicely in the music. Come with me and you'll be Hereby using a melody from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory to establish the same theme. The more you become aware of intertextuality, the more you see it everywhere. Check out these examples. Don't move. McCarthy. I'm almost dead. Kyle, cast arcane missiles. I'm out of mana, I told you. I've got to heal. <laughs> Crew, we have a new member of the team. We meet again, Captain Daly! We're trapped! So that's intertextuality. If you're watching a text and it reminds you of something else, or it references something that you recognize, it's probably intertextuality. And it's your job to try and work out why has the producer done this? Was it an Easter egg? Was it paying homage? Was it done for parody? Or maybe was it borrowing meaning from the other text? As always, I hope you found this video useful. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.